As I said last week, the problem with preaching Scripture the way I am, uh, going entirely through a book of the Bible, um, maybe not verse by verse, but certainly verse or passage or section by section, means that I constantly am running into something that I don't want to talk about. And last week it was talking about how we can't really be materialistic, and if our hope is in this world, then we should be pitied over all people, as Paul said. And how if we love and follow Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that we can name and claim and write our own recipe and that we really do need to find our satisfaction in him. And we can't be promising each other incredible, worldly, material, relational, physical blessings on earth before heaven, though God does give every good and perfect gift. And he often does prosper us in many ways. Sometimes he doesn't. And so that was real fun because, you know, then a lot of people don't come back to church because that's kind of preaching against the American dream. But, you know, the American dream is not in Scripture. Uh, I just don't like to mention that, as, you know, that often because the people don't like it. And so this week uh, I am even more challenged because I've ran right into a passage that I can't seem to escape um, talking about things I'm very uncomfortable talking about and things that I have managed to go years without talking about um, from the pulpit, at least, to my church, and, and that is the issue of um, salvation theology, or uh, as the theologians call it, soteriology. They would call it salvation theology, but they like to seem smarter than the rest of us, but soteriology or salvation theology, and the problem I have this week is that Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, says some things that makes him seem like a Calvinist. And if you don't know what a Calvinist is, I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. And then in the same breath says something that maybe seems like perhaps he's Arminian. And if you don't know what Arminian is, I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. And he really says some things that, um, that are a little bit troubling to us if we exist in one theological camp or another theological camp in our salvation theology, our soteriology. And so uh, I have to kind of talk about that because I don't really know how to preach this passage without talking about that. And not only that, I feel like God wants me to talk about that. But the good news today is my purpose in talking about soteriology or salvation theology or the different schools of theological thought when it comes to salvation is not to convert you to one point of view, um, but to make you aware of the debate, to make you aware of the conversation. And in, in my real purpose in this, um, is I think the overall consequence of having a little bit of a conversation about this, it's really not a conversation, I'm, I'm going to be the only one talking, but it is, is that one thing for sure that we will come away with, we will come away um, with a greater um, understanding or appreciation of the magnitude of the mystery of salvation, of how an unholy man comes into a right relationship with a holy God, we will probably um, grow in our appreciation and begin to marvel more at the love that God has for us, that he so passionately pursues us and so consistently in a sustained way pursues us, that he is the author, that he is the uh, sustainer and the finisher of our faith and our salvation. And it will fill us, I hope, with an incredible gratitude um, that we could have a relationship with God. And, um, you know, one of the things I find that I sometimes take for granted is the fact that it's seemingly every time I open my Bible and bow my head in prayer, um, sometimes I have a greater experience than other times, but consistently I experience God. If I open my Bible and open my heart at the same time and I come to him humbly and hungry, I hear him speak to me through his word. And as scripture says, he sustains everything through his powerful word. And I hear it not just in a general academic sense. I hear him speaking to me personally through the word. I hold those things. I treasure them in my heart. Uh, I obey them. I just uh, I hold on to them as a promise. Whatever it is, I, 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 I try to... Um, morph my thinking and my attitude and my actions to what God is saying to me. And inevitably, when I do that, wonderful things eventually happen if I persevere. And, and sometimes I can take for granted that God has made himself so available to me um, that I don't realize what a big deal it is that a fallen and broken man like me would ever know and have intimacy with a holy God. Uh, they call it the mystical union. Uh, the, the intimacy with God that surpasses um, even the intimacy we have in marriage. 
Um, The fact that Jesus in one place said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. He almost exalts us above the angels in that sense. He he tells us his will and he allows us to participate. And and, and, you know, we we sometimes think because we use the word discipleship in that regard that that's kind of drudgery, but really it is a wonderful, huge, brilliant, life-saving, eternal gift. Um, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, it's like saying, welcome, my friend, to the show that never ends because it just continually, if we submit to it and surrender to it, it continually just envelops into wonder, more wonderful and more great things as we go along. And so I want to talk a little bit about the debate today because, one, Jesus is kind of making me. And two, not to get you into a certain theological thought, but I promise you, if you hear this the right way, By the time you leave here today, wherever you are theologically, unless you're like a hyper-Calvinist, you're going to have a greater appreciation of how much God does and how little we do in regards to our own salvation and how far God has come to lead us back to a right relationship with him. And and I think that is very, very healthy, Um, will lead to a lot of gratitude And it will definitely humble us, but ironically, even as it humbles us, I think it will fill us with the greatest of self-esteem. As David said, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And that was David just coming to this place where he was like, I am so broken, I am so foul, and yet a holy God pursues me, sustains me, corrects me, fixes me, uh, holds me, and and is even promising me eternal things. And he was just blown away by it. And I hope we have a similar experience today as we go through this passage in God's Word. So I'm going to narrow down um, about 2,000 years of theological debate in about three minutes. How does that sound? And, and if there's any theologians in the room, you're going to hate my ever-living guts. But I don't care. I, me and theologians, we don't always get along very well. But there are, there are four basic uh, camps through history And let's consider it a spectrum. So just pretend that you can see what I'm writing here, but pretend there's a line and it's a spectrum. It's not a timeline, it's a spectrum. And and on one end of the spectrum, um, we have a theological, um, soteriological view called um, Pelagianism. Pelagianism. And way over here, this guy named Pelagius, and not so much him, but people who kind of adopted his thoughts and developed them through time, they felt like that sin was not original sin, that the, that the environment we lived in was sinful, and that we could be tempted into sin, but that human beings were born innocent and had the capacity um, to earn salvation through their own merit and sinlessness. And so, uh, very little grace in this view. And by the way, this is, by anyone that we would respect, considered utter heresy. So that's Pelagianism, Pelagius, like 400, you know, uh, A.D., who cares about that? But that's one view, heresy. We don't care about that one. But way over here, just, you know, so you know. If you think you can earn salvation, you're wrong. Just try. You'll fail, like, in an hour. The second view, they call semi-Pelagianism. And this view is like Pelagianism, and and basically semi-Pelagianism, they would say uh, that we are fully partners and we kind of cooperate in the salvation process. Yes, God comes, and God comes with this grace, um, but we have completely free will, and we, out of our own merit and our own effort, have to respond to that, and, there, and there's no working um, inside of us by God or his grace or his spirit to bring us to that point. That, that is heresy as well. And, and most people, um, basically anyone you know that you would respect theologically, any major denomination, any major preacher or teacher, would not exist in this camp either. So Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, bad. Cut, we'll cut that part of the spectrum off. Now, the part of the spectrum that we kind of exist in today and the two views that you hear um, in seminaries and different places as relevant views today, uh, one is called Arminianism and, and the other is, is Calvinism. Now, there, there are those, not me, who would just say that's just two categories, it's not a spectrum. Uh, They would say, uh, Arminianism is here, Calvinism is here, you're in one camp or the other, but 
in my own experience, and since, you know, I'm the pastor here, I'm going to preach it my way. I'll tell you what other people say, just so you're fully informed, but I feel like there is a spectrum there. Um, I like to tell people I'm a Calvinist, except when I'm not. And that's because I can't settle on a point of view. Through 2,000 years of church history, really smart people who I really respect and that you would really respect too land on both sides of this debate. The Arminianists would say that salvation is like 99.9% God. And, and that if Jesus didn't come, and if the Holy Spirit didn't come, and remember what Jesus said, it's good for you that I go. He was talking to his disciples. It's good that I ascend into heaven, because once I ascend into heaven, I'll descend or I'll pour out my Holy Spirit, and it will convict the world of sin and righteousness, right? In other words, it'll go ahead and kind of convict the world so that when you come and preach the gospel, their hearts are ready to receive it. And so they would agree with all of that, 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 that God is the author of salvation, and the sustainer, and the finisher, of course, and they would say, um, they would say that is all grace, you know, beginning and end, but they would say that grace that comes to us so gratuitously is resistible. Um, they would say it's, it's there, God is empowering it, he's knocking on their heart, um, it, it may not be easy to resist because his love is so powerful and contagious, and the power of the Spirit is so amazing, but they would say that grace is resistible. And, and they would probably go on to say, I mean, and there, you can't put anybody in a you know, precise category here, but many of them would go on to say that that, that that grace is offered universally to whoever, you know, hears the word of God especially. And the difference in salvation or no salvation is those who resist versus those who surrender to the Holy Spirit and to the gospel. And then the Calvinists would be way over here, and the Calvinists would say, uh-uh, um, Salvation is entirely out of the sovereignty of God, and grace is absolutely irresistible. And so um, verses like, those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Um, Some would say that is God's foreknowledge of those who would receive him in advance, because God knows everything. Uh, he's the Alpha and he's the Omega. He knows who's going to resist his grace. He knows who's going to not resist his grace. But the Calvinists would say about that, and they would have a pretty good case with the way they interpret the language, that foreknew means to have loved in advance. Um, he predestined. And they would say that, it, that the atonement of God, the pouring out of the blood of Jesus Christ, is very limited and specific, and God knows in advance who he elected and who he didn't elect. And that is a real controversy for many people. If there weren't scriptures that almost led me there, I would never believe that. But I, but I have a very difficult time through time staying in that camp. I usually retreat back over here to the Arminian camp or somewhere in between because that was more of my theological roots and the way I was trained. Now, I don't really care where you exist on that spectrum. Uh, if you are an Arminian and you believe that God's grace goes out to everyone and we don't want them to resist it and surrender to it, you're probably going to be, you know, a little more um, passionate about the mission. Um, And if you're a Calvinist, what I would say to you, that's fine if you want to believe in predestination. Uh, One, don't come into my church and start theological wars with people because, by the way, theology in and of itself can be a very unhealthy thing. Um, I've experienced it in seminary and with many people I know, people who are overly theological can often be very puffed up about their ideas. It can lead to incredible arrogance about the things of God. I find it much better just to open up scripture and come humbly like I need a word to be saved. That's more my view. But if you want to be a Calvinist, that's fine. I suggest you be a closet Calvinist so you don't create division in the church. And I, and I suggest that you presume that every single person you see is predestined. Uh, I've heard it said that we should, um, we should preach and work like an Arminian and sleep like a Calvinist. That might be a good blend of these two things. I want you to be aware of these two views as we enter into the passage today. And, and, and what I want you to be more aware of than anything is that the, that the two Pelagian views have been totally shut down. Scripture shuts them down. And the only argument that we have is how resistible is grace? I mean, how resistible? John Wesley said, 
And John Wesley's my guy. When he was talking about the difference between him and Calvin, he was called Arminian. He said, I'm not really Arminian because I'm not that far over. He loved the spectrum idea. He would have said, I'm a little more over on the spectrum towards Calvinism. And they asked him, well, is grace irresistible? He said, well, almost, almost irresistible. And he wouldn't say that it was actually totally irresistible. And he said that he felt like his theology for salvation and John Calvin's theology for salvation were only an eyelash apart. Now, they weren't contemporaries. Uh, uh, Wesley came around you know, 100, over 100 years after Calvin, and I don't think Calvin would have agreed with Wesley on this. But the point of the matter is, um, all Orthodox theologians, wherever they exist on this you know, spectrum of soteriology, we all agree that Jesus paid it all, uh, that Jesus did it all, that if he hadn't come, if he hadn't sent his spirit, if he didn't continue to send his spirit, then we would have nothing. Uh, He sends his word, which is embedded with his spirit, and he comes and he retrieves us. And what I would say to you today is if you have a heart to hear, an ability to perceive and to receive, then you are receiving a gift from God. And this is not of yourselves. This is absolutely a beautiful, wonderful gift from God. It is something that we should magnify. It is something that we should marvel. It is something that should bring incredible gratitude, and we should have um, incredible devotion as a response to how far God came from heaven to earth to reach men. Uh, With all of that said, we'll finally get into the scripture and begin in uh, chapter 6, verse 37. As you remember, this chapter began with the feeding of the multitude, and then it, then it moved on to, the, to a lot of the people in that crowd coming to Jesus. They wanted to make him king by force. They didn't recognize that he was the one and only Son of God, the Messiah, the one to be worshipped. They thought it would be great if his kingdom was of this world, and he could sit on a throne, and he could like you know give us a bunch of food and beat people up and make us great. And Jesus had nothing to do with that. He was more interested in a kingdom that was achieved through humility, Um, As scripture teaches, those who humble themselves shall be exalted, um, that that we are to share in his suffering, to share in his glory, and that his kingdom, kingdom, though it is coming incrementally in space and time on earth as it shall in heaven, will ultimately come at his second return. And so it's really awesome to get saved, and it's really awesome to want to be in the kingdom of God, but it's not immediate gratification all the time, Right? And so that lends into the conversation, like, who would actually want this kind of gospel? Uh, Who, in and of themselves, and of their own spirit, and their own emotions, and their own mind, would ever receive such a gospel that promised everything so far away, where you kind of had to give God a lot of credit, um, unless you, you know, were truly experiencing his spirit and had perception and the ability to receive. And so, uh, again, the tension, the sovereignty of God versus free will. And you're going to find, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a lot more questions than I'm going to answer. I'm going to present the case, and I'm not really going to take a side. Um, but hopefully, in the tension and in the conversation, something constructive will very much happen. So these guys didn't really believe him. And one of the last things Jesus said, you know, you see me, but you don't really believe me. And, and remember, when Jesus said, believe in me or believe me, what he was really saying is give your life to me. It wasn't just believe that I'm cool or believe that I'm... Uh, that I could be great. It wasn't just believe that I'm kind of te- saying the truth, even though you don't quite understand it. it. It was a level of belief that led to conviction, that led to action, that led to following him. He was saying, you need to give your life to me. Uh, it's not just about me giving you bread. I am the bread. And if you really want to experience what all this salvation is all about, it's going to happen as you feed on me in your relationship with me. I probably have many people in this room today who are really in need. You feel like you're drowning in circumstances. It can be uh, something obvious and external like a financial crisis or a a crisis in your health. It could just be something internal like depression and sadness or brokenness. It could be a relational issue. Whatever it might be, you may be coming here for the solution. And I can promise you this, that if Jesus were standing here he would say first and well actually he probably would walk around and pet you like sheep but uh, if he were standing here and ministering in this room he would look you in the eye and he would say before I do one thing for you circumstantially you need to find your contentment in me and this is what he said to them and they couldn't receive it and this is similar to what or you know indirectly what he said to his disciples and they did receive it and give their life to him and so we have this we have the difference we have the masses who hear 
and do not believe, receive, or obey. And then we seem to have um, some who do hear, believe, receive, and obey. And we're trying to understand that. And Jesus kind of gets into that in this section of his discourse. Coming off of that in verse 37, he says this. Jesus says, by the way, this is Jesus speaking for himself. All those the Father gives me will come to me. Now think about that. Let's just stop at the comma. Uh, You notice this is a shorter passage than I normally do because I'm like, wow, we got to talk about that. All those the Father gives me will come to me. All of them. Now, did that happen out of those he pre-elected or those he pre-knew? I don't know. We don't have to do that right now. But all those the Father gives me will come to me. In other words, Jesus, it seemed to be ministering like an Arminian, but he probably slept like a Calvinist. And, and he's sitting there with this great um, multitude in front of him, and he could have won their hearts over in a worldly way. They were, I mean, he could have been the most effective politician of all time, but that's not what he was looking for. He was looking for depth to their commitment, and, and, and that level of depth was insufficient. Let me just flip that back on you today. What is your depth? What, what is your commitment level to Jesus Christ today? Uh, wh- wh- where are you with that? And Jesus is standing there and he's saying, all those the Father gives me will come to me. I don't have to water it down. I don't have to boil it down. Uh, When I fed you, when I fed the multitude, it wasn't to win a a big church. I fed the multitude as actually more of an illustration than meeting needs. I'm more than happy to meet needs. Part of the illustration was showing you that I am more than happy to use my power and acts of compassion. But really, that whole illustration was to set up this discourse. And this discourse is very much about your level of commitment. And you see how powerful I am, and you see what I can do, and we all know that to be true, but you see that you can't manipulate me, and and I want to know your level of commitment. And then he says, but all of you who really uh, have the capacity to believe and to receive and obey, I won't lose you. And, 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 you know, as we read through this chapter, and it's going to take a couple more weeks to do that, we find that many people at this point turn back and no longer follow Jesus. As far as Jesus was concerned, he's standing in front of an audience, and he's like, I already know who's going to turn back. I already know who I have and I don't have. All the Father gives me will come to me. All of them. Now, to me, you know, you can flip that around, you can invert it, and, 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 it, and it's kind of like saying, only those the Father gives me will come to me. Now, that's a little troubling for me because I'm much more comfortable being an Arminian, but when I read this half of the passage or this half of the sentence, I'm like, man, I think Jesus is a Calvinist. And that's a little troubling for me. And it's almost as if Jesus is saying, remember when he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into his fields. You know what he was saying? Just go and preach and teach. My spirit has gone ahead of you. Hearts are ready. Some never will be ready. All and only those the Father has given me will come to me. Uh, many times God says things that, like that to me when I'm speaking, especially if I'm speaking to a, a large crowd. I, get, I had an opportunity about a year ago to speak Um, a couple years ago to speak to a huge crowd like 10,000 people and this year they've asked me to come back and do that twice to like 20,000 each time and isn't that exciting and so I got to get up there and I'm thinking how can I reach every heart and it's like God is saying you don't have to just stand there and tell them the truth whatever I'm telling you to tell them tell them and the word never returns void it's absolutely secure now for a pastor this is good news because we realize that our focus should be on faithfulness and obedience, and not on results. But we're carnal like everybody else. I would really like for a lot more people to be here today. But God is saying, you know what? I have a plan. It's predestined. And all those, whether it's through foreknowledge or just pre-election, and hey, wherever you stand on that, I'm fine with it, will come to me. Isn't that good news? That should liberate us in our evangelism, and it should also make those of us who are believing, receiving, and obeying God, who are learning and growing in our faith, incredibly grateful. Who who am I that God is mindful of me? 
Uh, This isn't my own psychology. I did not conjure up my salvation. When I heard Jesus, when I came to the altar, it was because because he came from heaven to earth to show me the way. And we should marvel at that. We should celebrate that. We should not take that for granted. This is not my mass psychosis. This is a move of the Spirit. And so Jesus is there. He's like, if you're mine, you're mine. If you're not, you're not. Like it, don't like it, it's entirely up to you. He was that way. I think he would have had a smaller church than me even, as we're about to see. And, but then the, the sentence changes a little bit. And he goes on to say, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And that word whoever, um, well, that seems more inclusive, doesn't it? We shifted from this real, you know, empirical thing to this more whoever. or As John says, whosoever shall come to him will not perish but have eternal life. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so he seems to be, you know, uninclusive and inclusive. And, and by the way, Calvinists and Arminius would both use this verse. I mean, I promise, I looked it up. I studied it this week. They both use this verse to make their case. But to me, I see a divine mystery. I see all, which could mean only, and I see whoever, which could mean whoever. And I see a mystery, and it's, it's cloudy to me. And I kind of like the fact that it's a mystery because it makes me think about it. It makes me ponder it. And, and, and you know, I was, I was praying about this this week. I'm like, Lord, why don't you just send your spirit and send a unanimous spirit of soteriology upon the church? And, and it was kind of like, maybe he didn't say this, but I felt like what the Lord said is, no, I just like y'all fighting about it. It's fun to watch. And, you know, sometimes truth is truth and truth is empirical and it's never relative but sometimes we find the truth um, as iron sharpens iron and perhaps in this area of salvation which exists in the in the mind of God not in the mind of man it, it it is so deep it is so intellectual it is so powerful it is so beyond our finite minds that it should be a mystery it should be a mystery and we should wallow in the mystery and we should marvel in it I mean that's what David was doing He's, it was before Calvinism and Arminianism. He's just sitting there going, I can't figure out why he would save me, but I am really glad he did. And I have no idea why he loves me more than he loves a lot of these Philistines, but I sure am glad he does. And I have no idea why I seem to be a man after God's heart and Saul didn't, but I sure am glad that I am. And he knew very little of the credit or the merit belonged to him. And I can assure you that very little of the credit or the merit belongs to us This is a gift of God that we receive by faith. In verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. We're going to see through this passage over and over again, it's always talking about the Father's will. Uh, The debate seems to be somewhat uh, uh, of how inclusive is my will and God's will. Um, How much participation does my will have in the will of God? And one thing we see with Jesus is he doesn't talk about the will of man very much. In this passage, he talks over and over about the will of God. Um, Remember what we talked about on Christmas Eve, um, when I said, you know, in in the Old Testament, the prophets um, spoke about God looking down from heaven to earth after humanity had fallen to see if anyone, any sought him, any looked up for him, any tried to lead for him, any had a theological thought, anybody looked at a mountain and said, wow, there must be a God who made that. And he looked from heaven to earth and and it was as if he was saying there was no one. There was no one to even think about salvation. There was no one to even think about God. There was no one looking up. Uh, We were completely contented to be in our life of sin and, and, and just to live our 45 minutes under the sun, fighting and contriving and trying to get ahead, supply and demand, hit the marketplace, live the best you can, give some money to your kids, and, and, and it says he was appalled. He was angry. He was broken. He was hurt. And out, of, and out of the strong will of God, no will of man, but out of the strong will of God, he looked through the corridor of time and he saw you and I included in this equation. He, he, it says he worked salvation himself with his own right hand, with his son who came uh, and sat at his right hand, right? And so whatever you believe um, about our ability um, to respond to God's will with our own will, one thing we can be very, very clear about is that salvation entirely happened out of the will of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of comfort. 
Because there are days where I think I may not be a Christian anymore. There are days where I, I actually, I think, out of my will, make a decision definitely not to be a pastor anymore about every month. And, and it's because, like, there, there ain't no want to. You know what I'm saying? In my flesh, there ain't no want to. Uh, when you do the cost-benefit analysis on earth, as Paul says, you should be pitied over all, it doesn't work out. It's expensive. It brings persecution. All the promises are way in the future. Um, you do things you're uncomfortable with and, and you enter into this cosmic battle and even knowing all of this and knowing the outcome like there's just not enough want to even when you're fully informed I, well, maybe you're a better Christian than me maybe you're a Pelagian but I doubt it and yet somehow amazingly when I get into that place where I allow the Holy Spirit to flood my heart not only do I have the want to I can't wait to isn't that amazing isn't that a gift? I mean, how many of you have ever written, however many of you have ever written a tithe check and, and, and it was the biggest one you ever wrote and you, and you liked it? Has that, ever, has that happened here yet? Nobody, nobody's raising their hand. I, there, that explains a lot of our issues right there. How many of you have um, struggled to find the will to go on a mission trip or to join a D group or to quit this horrible sin or at least try to surrender it to God and let his light flood in? Like anything out of obedience, and, and it began with fear and trembling, and it was not easy, and there was very little want to, but somehow in the power of the Holy Spirit, out of his will, our will was taken over, and we found the power to do it. That's transformation. And, and that is living in the strong will and the power of God. Um, you might say that grace comes many times in the form of crisis, which causes us to surrender. This is what John Wesley said, which leads to transformation. And we exist in the strong will of God. Uh, in Philippians, it says, it is God in us, the power of the Holy Spirit in us, God in us, that causes us to will and act according to his good purposes. So if there is anything praiseworthy about you, glory, praise, and honor to God, no, you get no credit. If there's anything good, if there's anything praiseworthy, glory, praise, and honor to God. Uh, when we go to heaven one day, you know what we're going to be rewarded for? We're going to be rewarded for the things that we did, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Because what we're going to find is any, anything we did in the flesh, even if it seemed good, was of us. It was for our vanity. It was for our ego. It was for some little special way we had to exalt ourselves, but things that we did in the Spirit as the Spirit of God landed in us and inspired us and led us are going to be the things that God rewards in heaven because those are the things that came through salvation. Those are the th things that came out of the strong will of God. Those are the things that we, we have to say glory, praise, and honor to God. It came to me by His Word, through His Spirit, and it, it came along with, it was embedded with the power to do it. And so salvation, which comes uh, by faith and hearing God's word and begins with the message of the gospel, but then continues through every single word that comes after it and our ability um, to receive it, believe it, and, you know, submit to it. It's entirely, entirely of God. And so when we hear God's word and we know that he's speaking to us and at least for the moment are resisting it, I would also say to you that we are resisting the strong will of God. And we have lost the sense of magnitude. And we have lost our ability to marvel at how great this salvation is that we would take words from God, whether they be corrective or encouraging, and hold them with contempt. And you know, the good news is he's the author, the sustainer, and the finisher. He began a good work in us. As you often hear me say, he will finish it. But sometimes we go through a, a, the valley of the shadow of darkness, and we seem to have the ability to resist God. Maybe we always do. That's the theological debate. But what I would say to you today is if you know what God wants and you don't do it, whoa, at least in the temporal sense, because that is the actualization of, of your strong salvation. I'm going to go faster so we get through this. By the way, it's a short passage today. Not short. I know we've only done like two verses. In the next verse, and he says this, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up, 
the last day. So one thing we can be sure of is assurance. Whether we believe that we resist grace or have the ability to resist grace or grace is irresistible, one thing for sure is once we have received Christ and we have been captured by his grace, we are in. And I would say to the degree and to the proportion of our ability to continue to abide in that relationship, to hear from God, to obey God, um, we even begin to experience that great salvation um, in proportion on earth as we shall in heaven. Not necessarily materially or physically or externally or circumstantially, not necessarily not those ways, but certainly internally. We begin to experience that peace and joy that surpasses understanding. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit and we actually have the ability as we are pliable and surrendered to him to experience his pleasure. And even on the dark days, we know that he'll never leave us or forsake us, but he'll finish the work he began. In verse 40, for my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son... See, this seems inclusive again, doesn't it? See, just when you think he's a Calvinist, he gets inclusive again. I think he's messing with us. I don't even think... Maybe he wasn't even talking to the crowd. Maybe he was talking to, like, theologians in the 20th century. I am going to mess with them. I'm going to give both sides some stuff so they can argue with each other and knock each other out, but I'm not going to tell anybody what's really going on. Even John Calvin, by the way, who was the ultimate Calvinist and didn't even like probably what a lot of the Calvinists where they took his theology, even Calvin would begin to explain, explain his theology and then he would get to a point where people would ask him hard questions and he'd go, yeah, that's a mystery. Isn't that great? That's what you can do in theology when you don't know. It's a mystery and then you walk away and seem really spiritual. It's like saying I have no idea. There's a flaw in my theology. And so he said that everyone who looks at the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. Everyone. And I will raise them up at the last day. And this is a clear indication that, that John was looking for the return of Christ. Um, and, and he had a futuristic eschatology. He had a futuristic end times theology. There are those who believe that the church in this day, in this age, in this time, has entered into the final era. And we will bring um, heaven to earth and establish the kingdom of God on earth and the millennial reign uh, now. And there are those like me who believe, nope, Jesus, there's, that's all in the future. Anyway... That's really not our main point today, but I'll throw that in there. In verse 41, it says that this the Jews began to grumble about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And that was back from the passage before. And he's saying, basically, I came from heaven. I didn't come from earth. I, I'm from above. I'm not a great man. I'm the God man. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I am the bread on which you feed. I am life, eternal life. I am superior to any prophet, great king, evangelist, whatever it might be. John the Baptist, even he said I was greater than him. I'm kind of the man, Jesus is saying, you know. I don't know if you know it or not, I'm kind of a big deal. And then he went on to, and they said, it is not, is this not Jesus? Notice this, this is important. The son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how can he now say, I came down from heaven. And there it is. We believe that he might be the prophet. We believe that he might be the next King David. We believe that he's powerful. We believe that in a sense he is from God. We believe that he is anointed by God. We like him. We love him. We actually are willing to pledge a level of loyalty to him. Some of us would give our life to him in a political crusade. We're fans uh, we're political confidants. We're willing to be as intimate and connected and close and honoring and exalting of him as, as is as earthly possible. And he spits in our face. He insults us. And, and he says things like, you know what? I know you think I'm a great man. I know you want to exalt me. But that's not sufficient. Because I'm from above. I'm, I'm God. You've got you to worship me like God. Um, this is not the way you want it to be. And your faith in me is insufficient. As a matter of fact, it's deplorable to me. And it had to be incredibly insulting to, the, to him. And, and what it was, there was just a lack of depth in their understanding about who Jesus was. A great man versus a God man is entirely different. I, I can't tell you how many times... I've been, in, I've been in front of a congregation and preached week after week after week after week after week. 
And I have a member of my congregation, and they just never seem to kind of enter in. And then finally one day I have an opportunity to meet with them one-on-one. And and, and it all comes down to the identity of Jesus Christ and God-man versus great man. I believe that Jesus is a way. I believe that he was a great prophet. I'm very happy to be a Christian, but it's not really working for me. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You really aren't worshiping God. This is the one and only Son of God. If you think that his father is Joseph, think again. His father is God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit miraculously, not in the natural way. His mother was indeed Mary. That makes him human. But his father was God. That makes him God. That makes him divine. As we often say, the perfect human sacrifice to connect men to God. Not in a political way. Not in the, the way that you're willing to pledge yourself in your loyalty for purposes on this earth, but in an eternal way, and in a mystical way. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, this mystical union, this oneness that surpasses marriage. And, and Jesus is looking at them and saying, the way you want to relate to me is insufficient. We got to get married. You're going to have to eat my flesh. You're going to have to drink my blood. We're going to have to be enmeshed. Your loyalty to me isn't even on earth. It is, it is for heaven. And I'm going to take up resonance by the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart. I mean, this is what we're looking for. I was thinking about this today, and I was reading, and and that concept, that phrase, this oneness that surpasses the intimacy of marriage, I felt like, and this is kind of a little side piece, but this could help somebody today. I really felt with all my heart, like God said, Brian, you want to know why so many marriages are in trouble in your church and beyond? Intimacy. There's intimacy issues. But the intimacy issue is not between the husband and wife, the man and woman. The intimacy issue is between me and each of them. The intimacy issue is that that they are not individually and collectively intimate with me. Uh, God is the source of every good and perfect gift. He is absolutely the only source of the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is God, and, and God is love. The unconditional, uh, powerful, never-ending love that is the only way a marriage ever stays together. And, and, and Jesus is looking at these people and he's saying, That's, you got to have this intimacy with me uh, and love me so that you have the capacity to love one another, beginning with your own families, but even beyond, because that's the only way you're ever going to keep the law. And if you don't keep the law, you ain't coming to heaven. Remember Jesus on the, the Sermon on the Mount? He said, I haven't come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. Well, how are we going to fulfill the law? For years we've been hearing the law, and none of us can keep it except the Pelagians, and they were wrong. So we know that you can't keep the law in and of yourself. So how are you going to fulfill the law? It's simple. It's through this intimacy, this mystical union, this oneness that surpasses marriage. Infinite patience, infinite Um, wisdom just constantly being connected to the source of all good things like that is how we're going to accomplish this and Jesus is looking at them going man I don't really care whether we ever control one single government on earth Uh, as many of you good Christian uh, Americans want to believe that we're a Christian nation there's I don't think there's ever been one And, and, and I don't think that was ever the goal of God uh, certainly God in his providence and his sovereignty uh, lifts one nation up and brings one down, and he seems to favor nations like ours that have a level of freedom so that the church can, can grow and expand and the people can, are free um, to pursue and to find him. Surely God favors nations that are free, and he judges some that are not, and certainly God is not utterly out of control in that area, but as far as his ministry for his Christian church, the only thing that he really cares about dominion in is us. And the way he establishes his kingdom on earth and heaven in this realm and in this time is one mind and one heart at a time, not on the outside, but on the inside. And what he would say to you and I today is, I really am not that concerned what happens next week in the Supreme Court over gay marriage. I'm not that, I know this is spicy stuff because that's what I should be saying. I'm not that concerned with what Congress passes next week. I'm not that concerned in whatever I am concerned. Uh, I'll deal with it with what's happening in the Oval Office. What I'm concerned with is what is happening right here in you. And, and right here with your thoughts. Because whatever the world governments want to do, all those who are going to come to me, they're going to come. And and I'm not going to lose any of them. 
And I'm going to glorify myself on earth as in heaven, not by sitting on a throne, but by sitting on the throne of your heart and showing the world love through you. But here's the thing. You can't give it till you get it. Grace flows. And I hope today with all my heart that we are so filled with gratitude. We feel so elected that maybe just for a minute we're a Calvinist and we go, whoa, God just seized me. I mean, I, can, I, can ne- I will never forget the time that I first experienced the presence of God. I remember it. And it was years before I, re- I, I gave my life to Christ in, in a really good theological way. And I would say I had my conversion. It was years before that I was, I was really, really young, and, and, and my parents were divorced, and I was sitting on a swing, and I was swinging. I was, I don't know, maybe, six, maybe my son's age, six or seven years old, and I'll never forget, I was sitting on a, a swing, and I was singing um, um, Joy to the World song, but not the one that you know from church, because I didn't go to church. Uh, I was singing the one from Three Dog Night. Do you ever know that one? Joy to the world, all the boys and girls, joy to the fishes. Anyway, I was singing Joy to the World. And I was, but it was Three Dog Night. It wasn't the same one. They were, you know, had long hair and took drugs. And I was singing that song because it was popular on the radio. That's how old I am. And you young people don't know. Google it. It's awesome. 70s music is the best. And I was swinging and I was, list, and I was singing that song because I probably heard it on my mother's radio on the way to my nursery school or wherever it was. And, and I'll never forget that as I was singing that song, I immediately felt, experienced, and knew the presence of God. And it was at a time when our family was in a lot of peril and I was experiencing it as a very young man. And I, I remember a sense that everything was going to be okay. That I wouldn't be cold waiting on a bus to go to nursery anymore. That I wouldn't be hungry and that I was going to be okay. Because I began to experience that I wasn't going to be okay. And I felt like God said, we're, we're going to be okay. And almost days after that, my mother fell in love with my stepfather and he basically rescued us. And I tell you that whole story because, because God looked down from heaven to earth and he saw me on that swing and he decided, mm-mm, nope. The devil's not getting that one. He's not going to grow up and hurt. He's not going to grow up and be unloved. He's not going to not know my grace. And, and he came to me and he didn't ask me a question. He didn't make me sign a contract. There was no deal to be made. He came with unadulterated, in, in this particular case, I would say irresistible grace. And I mean, I did a lot of bad stuff between there and like 22 when I received him. But he never left me. Uh, Wesley would call that prevenient grace, the grace that brings us into a relationship with God. And what I hope today is that you marvel in that. Isn't that marvel? I mean, is anybody excited? Do you, if you really know and love Jesus, raise your hand. You didn't do it. Uh, don't come, I hate it when you say, I found Jesus. You know, you can't even find your car keys. <laughs> he found you. He rescued you. He gave his life for you. Why would we not give our life to him? Why would we plan an error in our life where we're going to ignore God and go do our own thing? Why do we want to go find our own way? He gave everything to us. And he's coming to these guys and saying, I'm giving everything to you, and and unless you give everything to me, this transaction can't happen. I'm asking for an intimacy that surpasses even marriage, a commitment that passes even the the covenant of marriage, through which actually the covenant of marriage and any other covenant with people are possible. Jesus responded, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. He kept saying that. You're gonna, man, I'm going to finish what I started. He said, it is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. And he wrote, everyone who heard the Father who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. And he was saying to a basically Jewish audience that if you really believe the prophets, if you really believe Moses, if you really believe the law, if you were really truly spiritually a Jew, then you would absolutely be coming to me. I mean, if you heard God then, you would be hearing God now. And the indication that though you may be a Jew by label is, is, is absolutely made evidenced through your ability to receive me. And and Jesus even said to to some religious leaders one time uh, that were all about Moses, Moses is our guy, you're not our guy. He said, let me tell you something, Moses looked forward to my day. 
If you really believe Moses, you would really believe me because the spirit of the Father and the Son that were upon Moses is clearly upon me because I'm the one and only Son of God. Clearly there is a level of responsibility. Even the Calvinist would say um, that it is God's sovereignty working along with human responsibility. They would say that ability to respond is a gift from God that comes with the word and with the spirit. And, and, and we could have a debate on that all day long, but clearly um, we are not zombies and we're not r- raptured into some you know, trance through which we devote ourselves to God. We have a responsibility. There is a call and there is a response. Um, how will they know if they don't hear and how will they hear if they're not preached to? And so you can say that when you hear the gospel, when it's preached to you from Scripture, uh, the Spirit of God goes out embedded in those words, and that is where, we, where faith is conceived and salvation, at least known salvation, begins. And so there is a call, and there is a response. We, we hear that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. We hear that he was conceived of the Virgin Mary. We understand that he walked and he taught and he lived a perfect life, and then he, then he died Uh, As the God-man, the perfect human sacrifice, we believe that he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and now he descends by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us into a right relationship with him. And if we believe that, after hearing that, then he is certainly here. Regardless of how charismatic the atmosphere is. But I would go even further than that. Uh, believing those words gives us the capacity to enter into a relationship with God by which we continue to live by every single word he sends our way. And with all my heart, right here and right now, I want us to be a community that hears, believes, and receives and obeys the word of God. Uh, I've heard this, I'll close with this, I've heard this great word picture given uh, to, to explain a couple different views on salvation, and they, they would say the Arminian believes that, um, that, that humanity is like on the surface, like we're on the surface of the water, and, and we're half, our lungs are half filled with water, and, and we're most certainly going to drown, and no matter how hard we work or fight against the water, we're going down. As a matter of fact, the harder we fight, the more likely we are to drown. And we are absolutely doomed to drown and to die in our circumstances, temporally and most certainly eternally, spiritually, forever. Uh, But the good news is that God, the gospel, Jesus through the cross, comes walking upon the water and he looks at us and and, and, and he throws a rope through which he'll pull us out. And, and he does, so, he's such a, you know, when I was a lifeguard, I used to throw ropes and practice to try to save people. I would just end up having to jump in because I was really bad at throwing the rope. But Jesus is really, really good at throwing the rope. And not only does he throw the rope, the rope literally lands right in our hand. And we see him clearly, and we know that we are doomed, and, and it's right there in our hand. And our, and our only thing that we have to do to receive that grace is clench it. And he pulls us right out of the water. And that would be maybe Wesley or the Arminian that would believe that. Now, the the Calvinists would come along and say, no, 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 it's not like that at all. It's more like this. You were dead. You were drowned. Your lungs were thoroughly saturated with water. Your brain was dead because you did not have the mind of God. You had only the mind of this world. And not only were you dead, you were on the bottom of the ocean, and you were like lodged under a rock, and your body was beginning to decay. And Jesus came along and he pulled you out from under the rock and he brought you to the surface and he restored your body a little bit and put half a lung of air back in there and he allowed you to experience the crisis and then, okay, sure, whatever the Arminian said from there, he threw the rope and he even gave you the good sense to grab it. Now, I don't know where you are on the theological spectrum. You may have not been on this theological spectrum, and I can assure you some of the best, most devout, beautiful Christians I've ever known didn't even know the spectrum existed. It's not even that important. But one thing we do know is this, that we have been called, and we have been called to respond. The crisis, if you're experiencing a crisis right now, if, if something is happening externally in your circumstances, in your mo- mind, and your emotions, and your heart that makes you sense crisis, I want you to not look at crisis like a bad thing anymore. I want you to look at it like grace. 
I mean, what is it to gain the world and forfeit your soul? Sometimes when God begins to destroy your world, it is to save your soul. I want you to look at that like grace. And if something ain't right, glory to God. Because anything that leads to wisdom before eternity is good news. And I want you to imagine you're on the surface of the water and you are drowning in temporal and eternal circumstances. And whether you, you may have been utterly dead, the Calvinist may be right. Either way, you're going to be dead. And God today is throwing you a rope. And here's the good news. You don't have to walk out of here and do anything. You don't have to walk out of here and immediately say anything. You don't have to go and achieve. You don't have to perform results. You don't have to be perfect yet. You just got to grab him. You just got to clench the rope. Uh, the crisis is grace that leads to an awakening, and the wisdom that God gives you is the ability uh, to grab the rope and to be absolutely and utterly saved. Each and every one of us here today should presume that we are predestined, uh, that God foreknew either because he knew out of his knowledge or he elected us, but you are pres just presume that you're predestined. And that he is here right now by the power of his Holy Spirit in me speaking to you and all around you in your heart. He is here and he is awaiting your response. And, and, and I don't believe that any of us are here today by accident. This is not an audience like the one Jesus is speaking to. This is an audience that didn't get fed a bunch of bread and, and, and you know, manipulated into being here. This is an audience that was drawn here by the Holy Spirit, and he who started that will finish it. I'm absolutely sure. But one thing we need to do today is we need to respond. And for some of, that, uh, of us, that is just receiving Christ as our Savior. For others of us, that is saying, gosh, that word that God has been giving me, that I haven't been resisting, that prompting, that conviction, that thing on my conscience, uh, that isn't condemnation. That's a lifeline. Uh, when God told me to give, uh, he wanted to bless my finances. When God wanted me you know, to, to pray with my wife, he wanted to bless the intimacy in my marriage. And you know, men, that could be good. When God wanted me to do this, he wanted to bless me for this. He isn't actually coming to me to take anything from me. As we learned at the beginning of the chapter, uh, he came, and when he sees the masses, he doesn't look at what he can take from them. He looks at what he can give them. But until they entrust themselves to him, he cannot entrust himself to them. And so he is the catalyst. He's the beginner, he's the finisher, and he's everything in between. But today, we have a moment. We have an opportunity to respond to the grace of God. And here's what I would say, and I'll close with this one more time. Respond to Christ and receive him as your Savior. And if you've already done to that, respond to Christ and submit to him as your Lord. And live by every single word he sends your way. And understand, every time God speaks... There is a good and powerful and sustaining will behind it. And it is always to bless you and never to harm you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you and praise you for this place and time again to come into your presence. We thank you for your word. And we thank you that it never returns void. I ask, dear God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that every single person in this room would not feel like I was speaking to them or praying to them corporately, but that you yourself were speaking to them personally. And I would ask you to give us the capacity to respond to you in any way that you see fit. Uh, praying my words on behalf of the words of many in this congregation, Lord, I want to say that we receive you as our Savior. Uh, we believe that you did indeed come and that you died on the cross for our sins. And because you paid the price of our sins, we don't have to. We believe that your blood, Lord Jesus, is theologically but also really spiritually washing over us and cleansing us and making us uh, holy, not by action, not by perfection, but by faith. And you are giving us the capacity to contain your Holy Spirit. That is our lifeline today. Jesus, you are my, you are my Savior. And Jesus, you are my Lord. And Lord, I pray that not only today would we respond in a general sense, uh, we wouldn't say yes to you, we wouldn't surrender to you, we wouldn't submit to you just in a general sense, but that you would unpack this message over the next week and you would speak so loud and so clear into our life. And when we hear those words, I pray that we wouldn't feel condemned and we wouldn't feel unnecessarily challenged and we wouldn't feel like you're after just, you know, 
beating us up. I pray that we would hear you and understand that this is to save our life and that we would respond. Lord, each and every one of us in many different ways, at many different times, we're that figure on the surface of that water struggling. And I thank you and praise you that the good news of the gospel of the cross is that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us in those circumstances. Whatever we're dealing with, you're right there. Send your lifeline, dear God, through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and lift us out. And we give you the glory in advance. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.